the British Orientalist Reynold Nicholson, who was an indefatigable translator of Rumi's verse, paid tribute to him as the greatest mystical poet of any age. Goethe drew, drew inspiration from some of Rumi's poems translated into German. And one of the immortals of Persian classical poetry, John Mee, who died in the latter part of the 15th century, said of him, he is not a prophet, but he has written a holy book, referring to the great Mesnevi, uh, which has also been called the Quran of mysticism and the inner truth of the Quran. Rembrandt drew him from a miniature painting. And uh, Gandhi used to quote his couplet, to unite, that is why we came. To divide, that is not our aim. UNESCO's first director general, Julian Huxley, lauded his spirit of international brotherhood. And in 1958, Pope John XXIII wrote a special message. In the name of the Catholic world, he said, I bow with respect before the memory of Rumi. Rumi's followers are referred to as dervishes, a term that implies uh, being a suppliant at the door that leads to spiritual purity, aspiration to the full consciousness of the unity of the beloved God. Through the ages, it has also taken on the connotations of a person who has abandoned life's base instincts and worthless material possessions. Um, I have a final recollection about that. Uh, in 1978, the whirling dervishes, the, the followers of, of Rumi, uh, came to the United States and they started their rituals at uh, Houston, Texas. Uh, and I was asked to give uh, an introductory lecture, which I did. And uh, at that lecture, I talked about uh, the same things, basically, of uh, abandoning these appetites and instincts and not caring about material possessions, etc. And uh, of course, it's a beautiful idea that uh, somebody divests himself of all those needs and requirements. And after the lecture, I asked, well, I mean, they'll be performing tomorrow, they arrived today, what did they do today? And I was told that they'd spent the entire day shopping. <laughs> The dervishes, uh, most of them at least, are not monks. They are not a celibate. They are not beggars. Uh, actually, begging is looked down upon in the uh, best mystical tradition. They are not mendicants. They never were. They are artisans, shopkeepers, teachers, workers, artists. Rumi himself preached the work ethic, as it were. Those who perform no work do not belong among our fellows here at once. Now, in the city of Konya, which at that time was a city of a great deal of tolerance, and many different minorities lived together, uh, but it was like, I suppose, an arbor today. Minority problems uh, existed in the 13th century, as they can exist even City like an arbor. And uh, whenever something would go wrong, uh, Rumi would intercede on behalf of uh, members of minorities. And of course, his moral authority was so strong that <clears throat> the impact was enormous. Now, in that city, uh, after having lived uh, a number of years and uh, studying and, and writing, he had become a very fine scholar, but basically an orthodox scholar, a conventional scholar. He was not a mystic in the early years of his intellectual development. But in the year 1244, a dramatic encounter changed his spiritual life. In Konya, he met a wild mystic who seemed to have come out of nowhere, Shamsuddin of Tabriz. Their meeting has been referred to as Najul Bahrain, which means convergence of the two seas. It is said that Rumi discovered the inner secrets of love through the influence of this man, who was called short, for short, Shams, which means the sun, the sun of the sky. And Rumi came to the realization that love transcends the mind. At this stage of his life, at age 37, 
He was, above all, a scholar who had read in depth in Persian, Arabic, Turkish, Greek, and Hebrew. He commanded vast encyclopedic knowledge and had written no poetry. And now passion reigned supreme over his mind. The frontiers of the intellect suddenly appeared too narrow, too constricting, too claustrophobic. And as a result of his affection, perhaps love, for this man, Shams, he embarked on a period of virtually constant ecstasy and excitement, of poetic creativity, of immersion in music, and the Sama evolved, mystical world. Symbolically, he became a torch that Shams fired. But then suddenly, Shams disappeared, and Rumi was passed for. It was a tragic separation. And immediately, there was the evolution of the mystical predicament. Because the mystic suffers from the fact that he has fallen apart from God's reality and beauty, and that he's an exile, an outcast on the face of the earth. And he can only fulfill himself by going back to God's reality through love. And this man, who was the guide to enlightenment and love, had disappeared. He wrote painful poems. Come, come, you will never find a friend like me. Where is a beloved like me in all the world? Come, don't waste your life turning back and forth. You are like a dry valley. I am the rain. You are a city laid waste. I am the architect. Come. But Shams was nowhere to be found. And a number of people close to Rumi went in search of Shams in different parts of the Middle East, but they came back empty handed. And that separation is best expressed in mystical literature through the focal metaphor of the reed flute, the nigh or the day. And it's interesting that Nirvana Jaratin Rumi's great philosophical work in 26,000 couplets, the great Masnavi, uh, which, as I mentioned before, is known as the Quran, the holy book, the sacred book of mysticism, opens with that very important image and metaphor, the image of the reed flute. That represents with its soul-piercing sad strains the uh, human spirit having fallen apart from God's reality. Now, Dr. Signal is going to play that beautiful instrument for you, and I'll interrupt at, uh, at some point and read to you the opening seven couplets of the great Mastavi, which expresses this idea of exile and separation. its tales, bemoaning its bitter exile, it wails. Ever since I was torn from the reed beds, my cries tear men's and women's hearts to shreds. Let this separation slip my sad breast, so I can reveal my longing and quest. Everyone is my friend for his own part, yet none can know the secrets of my heart. The flames of love Make the reed's voice divine. It is love's passion that rages in the wine. The reed cries with the lovers who fell apart. It rends the chest and tears open the heart. Nothing kills or cures the soul like the reed. Nothing can crave or console like the reed.
Rumi himself went in search of shells, but came back empty-handed. But after a short while, again, out of nowhere, Shams appeared in Konya. And that was the reunion of two great spirits that had inspired one another. And Rumi wrote a celebration of that, a short lyric poem, uh, which describes two lovers reunited. That can be two human lovers, or one man or woman, and God the beloved. Blessed moment, here we sit in this palace of love, you and I. We have two shapes, two bodies, but a single soul, you and I. The colors of the gardens and the songs of the birds among the flower beds will make us immortal, you and I. The stars of heaven will come out to gaze at us. We shall show the stars, moon herself, you and I. United in ecstasy, we shall no longer be you or I. Rescued from foolish babble, we shall rejoice, you and I. All the bright plumed birds of paradise will plunge into grief when they hear us laughing merrily, you and I. But that celebration was short-lived because a few months later, Chems was assassinated, probably by members of the group around Rumi who were afraid that Rumi had become excessively captivated by this wild mystic, and they assassinated him. And after that, Rumi although he couldn't believe it, and wrote many poems of uh, tragic despair, elegies which are among the world's greatest elegiac literature. And yet, all that made his spiritual life much more profound, much more meaningful in many ways. And he started looking deeper and deeper into his own heart. He felt little respect for organized religion stress the primacy of inner faith, inner allegiance. I roamed the lands of Christendom from end to end, searching all over, but he was not on the cross. I went into the temples where the Indians worship idols and the mediums chant prayers to fire. I found no trace of him. Riding at full speed, I looked all over the Muslim Kaaba, but he was not at that sanctuary for young and old. Then I gazed right into my own heart. There I saw him. He was there and nowhere else. This is essentially a poem of affirmation. But he wrote many poems of extremely potent protest and denial of traditional religion. The Holy Month. The people are bewildered and in pain. Why beat the drums? You can see it with your own eyes, it's plain. The drums make all that clamor like the outcry of evil. The Lord is death. That is why the drums blast again and again. Now that was truly, for any age, a heretical poet, a blasphemous poet. He also wrote, unless the seminaries and the minarets perish, the wandering dervish can reach no state he can cherish. Unless faith becomes disbelief, and disbelief is faith, no vassal of God will be a true Muslim and flourish. Only fools praise and glorify the mosque, while they oppress hearts full of love and faith. Sounds like Salman Rushdie, doesn't it? Written more than 700 years ago. Yet, when he experienced his ecstasy, the elevation of his spirit, it was such joy that he was writing rhapsodical rubaiis. This is such a day. The sun is dazzling twice as before. A day beyond all days, unlike all others. Say no more. Lovers, I have great news for you. From the heavens above, this day of love brings...